A reading from The Existence and Attributes of God by Stephen Charnock on Practical Atheism. The fool has said in his heart, There is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that does good. Psalm 14, verse 1. Practical atheism is to natural man in his depraved state and very frequent in the hearts and lives of men. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. He regards him as little as if he had no being. He said in his heart, not with his tongue, nor in his head. He never firmly thought it, nor openly asserted it. Shame put a bar to the first, and natural reason to the second. Yet perhaps he has sometimes some doubts whether there were a God or not. He wished there weren't any, and sometimes hoped there were none at all. He cannot erase out the notion of a deity in his mind, but he neglected the fixing the sense of God in his heart. It made it too much his business to deface and blot out those characters of God in his soul which had been left under the ruins of original nature. Men may have atheistical hearts without atheistical heads. Their reasons may defend the notion of a deity, while their hearts are empty of affection to the deity. Job's children may curse God in their hearts, though not with their lips. There is no God. Most understand it of a denial of the providence of God, as I have said in opening the former doctrine. He denies some essential attribute of God, or the exercise of that attribute in the world. He that denies any essential attribute may be said to deny the being of God. Whosoever denies angels or men to have reason and will is a human and angelic nature, because understanding and will are essential to both those natures. There could neither be angel nor man without them. No nature can subsist without the perfections essential to that nature, nor God be conceived of without his nature. The Apostle tells us in Ephesians 2.12 that the Gentiles were without God in the world. So in some sense, all unbelievers may be termed atheists. For rejecting the mediator appointed by God, they reject that God who appointed him. But this is beyond the intended scope. Natural atheism being the only subject... Yet this is deducible from this, that the title not only belongs to those who deny the existence of God, the fool, or to those who contemn all sense of deity, and would root the conscience and reverence of God out of their souls, but it belongs also to those who don't give that worship to God which is due to him, who worship many gods or who worship one God in a false and superstitious manner when they don't have right conceptions of God, nor intend an adoration of him according to the excellency of his nature. All those that are unconcerned for any particular religion fall under this character. Though they own a God in general, yet they are willing to acknowledge any God that shall be coined by the powers under whom they live. The Gentiles were without God in the world, without the true notion of God, not without a God of their own framing. This general or practical atheism is natural to men, not natural by how they were created, but by their corrupted nature. It is against nature. As nature came out of the hand of God, but universally natural, as nature has been sophisticated and infected by the serpent's breath, 
in consideration of God, or misrepresentation of his nature, or is agreeable to corrupt nature, is a disowning the being of a God, is contrary to common reason. It is universally natural. The wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray as soon as they are born. Their poison is like the poison of a serpent. The wicked, and who by his birth has a better title, they go astray from the dictates of God and the rule of their creation as soon as they are born. Their poison is like the poison of a serpent, which is radically the same in all of the same species. It is similarly and fundamentally in all men. Though there may be a stronger restraint by a divine hand upon some men than upon others, this principle runs through the whole stream of nature. The natural bent of every man's heart is distant from God. When we attempt anything pleasing to God, it is like the climbing up a hill against nature. When anything is displeasing to him, it is like a current running down the channel in its natural course. When we attempt anything that is an acknowledgement of the holiness of God, we are fain to rush with arms in our hands through a multitude of natural passions and fight the way through the oppositions of our own sensitive appetite. How softly do we naturally sink down into that which sets us at a greater distance from God. There is no active, potent, efficacious sense of a God by nature. The heart of the sons of man is fully set in them to do evil. Ecclesiastes 8.11 The heart in the singular number, as if there were but one common heart beat in all mankind, and bent as with one pulse, with a joint consent and force to wickedness, without a sense of the authority of God in the earth, as if one heart acted every man in the world. The great apostle cites a text to verify the charge he brought against all mankind, In his interpretation, the Jews, who owned one God and were dignified with special privileges as well as the Gentiles that maintain many gods, are within the compass of this character. The apostle leaves out the first part of the text. The fool is said in his heart, but takes in the latter part in the verses following. He charges all. Because all, every man of them, was under sin. There is none that seeks God. In verse 19 he adds, What the law saith, it speaks to those that are under the law. That none should imagine he included only the Gentiles and exempted the Jews from this description. The leprosy of atheism had infected the whole mass of human nature. No man among Jews or Gentiles did naturally seek God, and therefore all were void of any spark of the practical sense of the deity. The effects of this atheism are not in all externally of an equal size. Yet in the fundamentals and radicals of it, there isn't a hair's difference between the best and the worst men that ever traversed the world. The distinction is laid either in common grace, bounding and suppressing it, or in special grace, killing and crucifying it. It is in every one either triumphant or militant, reigning or deposed. No man is any more born with sensible acknowledgments of God than he is born with a clear knowledge of the nature of all the stars in the heavens or plants upon the earth. None seek after God. None seek God as his rule, as his end, as his happiness, which is a debt the creature naturally owes to God. He desires no communion with God. 
He places his happiness in anything inferior to God. He prefers everything before him, glorifies everything above him. He has no delight to know him. He regards not those paths which lead to him. He loves his own filth better than God's holiness. His actions are tinctured and dyed with self, and are void of that respect which is due from him to God. The noblest faculty of man, his understanding in which the remaining lineaments of the image of God are visible, the highest operation of that faculty, which is wisdom, is in the judgment of the Spirit of God devilish, while it is earthly and sensual. And the wisdom of the best man is no better by nature. A legion of impure spirits possess it. Devilish is the devil, who though he believe there is a God, yet acts as if there were none, and wishes he had no superior to prescribe him a law, and inflict that punishment upon him which his crimes have merited. Hence the poison of man by nature is said to be like the poison of a serpent. Alluding to that serpentine temptation, which first infected mankind, and changed the nature of man into the likeness of that of the devil. So that notwithstanding the harmony of the world, that presents men not only with the notice of the being of a god, but darts into their minds some remarks of his power and eternity. Yet the thoughts and reasonings of man are so corrupt, as may well be called diabolical, and is contrary to the perfection of God, and the original law of their nature, as the actings of the devil are. For since every natural man is a child of the devil and is acted by that diabolical spirit. He necessarily has that nature which his father has, and the infusion of that venom which the spirit that acts him is possessed with, though the full discovery of it may be restrained by various circumstances, Ephesians 2, verse 2. So to conclude, though man, or at least very few men, arrive to a round and positive conclusion in their hearts that there is no God, yet there is no man that naturally has in his heart any reverence of God. In general, before I come to a particular proof, take some propositions. Number one, actions are a greater discovery of a principle than your words. The testimony of works is louder and clearer than that of your words. And the frame of men's hearts must be measured rather by what they do than by what they say. There may be a mighty distance between the tongue and the heart, but a course of actions is as little guilty of lying as interest is, according to our common saying. All outward impieties are the branches of an atheism at the root of our nature is all pestilential sores or expressions of the contagion in the blood. Sin is therefore frequently called ungodliness in our English dialect. Men's practices are the best indexes of their principles. The current of a man's life is a counterpart of the frame of his heart. Who can deny an error in the spring or wills when he perceives an error in the hand of the dial? Who can deny an atheism in the heart when so much atheism is visible in the life? The taste of the water discovers what mineral it is drained through. A practical denial of God is worse than a verbal because your deeds have usually more of a deliberation than your words. Your words may be the fruit of a passion, but a seventh of evil actions are the fruit and evidence of a predominant evil principle in the heart. All slighting words of a prince do not argue in habitual treason, but a succession of overt treasonable attempts indicate a settled treasonable disposition in the mind. 
Those, therefore, are more deservedly termed atheists, who acknowledge a God and walk as if there were none, than those, if there can be any such, to deny a God and walk as if there were one. A sense of God in the heart would burst out in the life, where there is no reverence of God in the life, it is easily concluded there is less in the heart. What does not influence a man when it has the addition of the eyes and censors of outward spectators and the care of a reputation, so much the God of the world, to strengthen it and restrain the action? It must certainly have less power over the heart when it is single without any other concurrence. The flames breaking out of a house indicate the fire to be much stronger and fiercer within the house. The apostle judges those of the circumcision, who gave heed to Jewish fables to be deniers of God, though he doesn't tax them with any notorious profaneness, Titus 1.16. They profess that they know God, but in their works they deny him. He gives them epithets contrary to what they arrogated to themselves. They boasted themselves to be holy. The apostle calls them abominable. They bragged that they fulfilled the law and observed the traditions of their fathers. The apostle calls them disobedient or unpersuadable. They boasted that they only had the rule of righteousness and a sound judgment concerning it. The apostle said that they had a reprobate sense, and they were unfit for any good work, and judges against all their vainglorious bragging, that they had not a reverence of God in their hearts. There was more of the denial of God in their works than there was acknowledgment of God in their words. Those that have neither God in their thoughts, nor in their tongues, nor in their works, cannot be properly said to acknowledge Him. Where the honor of God is not practically owned in the lives of men, the being of God is not sensibly acknowledged in the hearts of men. The principle must be of the same kind with the actions. If the actions are atheistical, the principle of them can be no better. Proposition number two. All sin is founded in a secret atheism. Atheism is the spirit of every sin. All the floods of impieties in the world break in at the gate of a secret atheism. And though several sins may disagree with one another, yet like Herod and Pilate against Christ, they join hand in hand against the interest of God. Though lusts and pleasures be diverse, yet they are all united in disobedience to him. All the wicked inclinations of the heart and struggling motions, secret repinings, self-applauding confidence in our own wisdom, strength, and so on, envy, ambition, revenge, are sparks from this latent fire. The language of every one of these is, I would be a lord to myself, and would not have a God superior to me. The variety of sins against the first and second table the neglecting of God and violence against man are derived from this in the text first. The fool is set in his heart and then follows a legion of devils as all virtuous actions spring from an acknowledgement of God. So all vicious actions rise from a lurking denial of him. All licentious goes glib down where there is no sense of God. Abraham judged himself not secure from murder, nor his wife from defilement in Gerar, if there were no fear of God there. He that makes no conscience of sin has no regard to the honoring, 
consequently none to the being of God. By the fear of God men depart from evil. Proverbs 16, verse 6. By the non-regarding of God men rush into evil. Pharaoh oppressed Israel because he knew not the Lord. If he did not deny the being of a deity, yet he had such an unworthy notion of God as was inconsistent with the nature of a deity. He, a poor creature, thought himself a mate for the Creator. In sins of omission we don't own God. In neglecting to perform what He enjoins, in sins of commission we set up some lust in the place of God and pay to that homage which is due to our Maker. In both we disown Him, in the one by not doing what He commands, in the other by doing what He forbids. We deny His sovereignty when we violate His laws. We degrease His holiness when we cast our filth before His face. We disparage His wisdom when we set up another rule as the guide of our actions. Then that law He has fixed. We slight His sufficiency when we prefer a satisfaction in sin before a happiness in Him alone. And His goodness when we judge it not strong enough to attract us to Him. Every sin invades the rights of God and strips him of one or other of his perfections. It is such a vilifying of God as if he were not God, as if he were not the supreme creator and benefactor of the world, as if we had not our being from him, as if the air that we breathe in, the food that we live by, were our own by right of supremacy, not of donation. For a subject to slight his sovereign is to slight his royalty, or a servant his master is to deny his superiority. Proposition 3 Sin implies that God is unworthy of a being. Every sin is a kind of cursing God in the heart, and aim at the destruction of the being of God. Well, not actually, but virtually. Not in the intention of every sinner, but in the nature of every sin. That affection which excites a man to break his law would excite him to annihilate his being if it were in his power. A man in every sin aims to set up his own will as his rule, and his own glory is the end of his actions against the will and glory of God. And could a sinner attain his end, God would be destroyed. God cannot outlive his will and his glory. God cannot have another rule but his own will, nor another end but his own honor. Sin is called a turning the back upon God, a kicking against him, as if he were a slighter person than the meanest beggar. What greater contempt can be shown to the meanest, vilest person than to turn your back, lift up the hill, and thrust away with indignation, all which actions, though they signify that such a one has a being, yet they testify also that he is unworthy of a being, that he is an unuseful being in the world, and that it were well the world were rid of him, all sin against knowledge is called a reproach of God. Reproach is a vilifying a man as unworthy to be admitted in a company. We naturally judge God and fit to be conversed with. God is a term turned from by a sinner. Sin is a term turned to, which implies a greater excellency in the nature of sin than in the nature of God. And as we naturally judge it more worthy to have a being in our affections, so consequently more worthy to have a being in the world than that infinite nature for whom we derive our beings and our all, and upon whom with a kind of disdain we turn our backs. 
Whosoever thinks the notion of a deity unfit to be cherished in his mind by warm meditation implies that he doesn't care whether he has a being in the world or not. Now, though the light of a deity shines so clearly in man, and the stings of conscience are so smart that he cannot absolutely deny the being of a god, yet most men endeavor to smother this knowledge and make the notion of a god a sapless and useless thing. Romans one twenty eight. They like not to retain God in their knowledge. It is said Cain went out from the presence of the Lord, Genesis 4.16. That is, from the worship of God. Our refusing or abhorring the presence of a man implies a carelessness whether he continue in the world or not. It is a using him as if he had no being, or as if we were not concerned in it. Hence all men in Adam, under the emblem of the prodigal, are said to go into a far country, not in respect of the place, because of God's omnipresence, but in respect of acknowledgement and affection. They mind and love anything but God. And the descriptions of the nations of the world, lying in the ruins of Adam's fall, and the dregs of that revolt is that they know not God. They forget God as if there were no such being above them. And indeed, he that does the works of the devil owns the devil to be more worthy of observance and consequently of a being than God, whose nature he forgets and whose presence he abhors. Proposition 4. Every sin in its own nature would render God a foolish and impure being. Many transgressors esteem their acts, which are contrary to the law of God, both wise and good. If so, the law against which they are committed must be both foolish and impure. What a reflection is there then upon the lawgiver? The moral law is not properly a mere act of God's will considered in itself, or a tyrannical edict. The moral law commands those things which are good in their own nature, and prohibits those things which are in their own nature evil, and therefore is an act of his wisdom and righteousness, the result of his wise counsel, and an extract of his pure nature as all the laws of just lawgivers, are not only the acts of their will, but of a will governed by reason and justice, and for the good of the public, whereof they are conservators. If the moral commands of God were only acts of his will, and had not an intrinsic necessity, reason, and goodness, God might have commanded the quite contrary, and made a contrary law, in which that which we now call vice might have been canonized for virtue. He might then have forbid any worship of him, love to him, fear of his name. He might then have commanded murder, thefts, adulteries. In the first, he would have untied the link of duty from the creature and dissolved the obligations of creatures to him, which is impossible to be conceived. For from the relation of a creature to God... Obligations to God and duties upon those obligations necessarily result. It had been against the rule of goodness and justice to have commanded the creature not to love him and fear and obey him. This had been a command against righteousness, goodness, and intrinsic obligations to gratitude. And should murder, adulteries, rapines have been commanded instead of the contrary, God would have destroyed his own creation. He would have acted against the rule of goodness and order. He had been an unjust, tyrannical governor of the world. Public society would have been cracked in pieces, and the world become a shambles, a brothel house, a place below the common sentiments of a mere man. All sin, therefore, being against the law of God, 
The wisdom and holy rectitude of God's nature is denied in every act of disobedience. And what is the consequence of this? But that God is both foolish and unrighteous in commanding that, which was neither an act of wisdom as a governor, nor an act of goodness as a benefactor to his creature. As I said before, presumptuous sins are called reproaches of God, Numbers 15, verse 30. The soul that does not presumptuously reproaches the Lord. Reproaches of men are either for natural, moral, or intellectual defects. All reproaches of God must imply a charge either of unrighteousness or ignorance. If of unrighteousness, it is a denial of his holiness. If of ignorance, it is a blemishing his wisdom. If God's laws were not wise and holy, God would not enjoin them. And if they are so, we deny infinite wisdom and holiness in God by not complying with them. As when a man believes not God, when he promises, he makes him a liar. 1 John 5.10 So he that obeys not a wise and holy God commanding makes him guilty either of folly or unrighteousness. Now suppose you knew an absolute atheist who denied the being of a God, yet had a life free from any notorious spot or defilement. Would you in reason count him so bad as the other that owns a God in being? yet lays by his course of action such a black imputation of folly and impurity upon the God he professes to own, an imputation which renders any man a most despicable creature? Proposition 5. Sin in its own nature endeavors to render God the most miserable being. It is nothing but an opposition to the will of God. The will of no creature is so much contradicted as the will of God is by devils and men. And there is nothing under the heavens that the affections of human nature stand more point-blank against than against God. There is a slight of him in all the faculties of man. Our souls are as unwilling to know him as our wills are averse to follow him. Romans 8, 7. The carnal mind is enmity against God. It is not subject to the law of God, nor can be subject. It is true, God's will cannot be hindered of its effect, for then God would not be supremely blessed, but unhappy and miserable. All misery arises from a lack of that which a nature would have and ought to have. Besides, if anything could frustrate God's will, it would be superior to him. God would not be omnipotent, and so would lose the perfection of the deity, and consequently the deity itself. For that which did wholly defeat God's will would be more powerful than he is. But sin is a contradiction to the will of God's revelation, to the will of his precept, and in this does it naturally tend to a superiority over God and would usurp his omnipotence and deprive him of his blessedness. For if God had not an infinite power to turn the designs of it to his own glory, but the will of sin could prevail, God would be totally deprived of his blessedness. Does not sin endeavor to subject God to the extravagant and contrary wills of men, and make him more a slave than any creature can be? For the will of no creature... Not to mean as the most despicable creature is so much cross as the will of God is by sin. Isaiah 43, verse 24. Thou hast made me to serve with your sins. You have endeavored to make me a mere slave by sin. Sin endeavors to subject the blessed God to the humor and lust of every person in the world. Proposition 6. Men sometimes in some circumstances wish that God had no being. This some think to be the meaning of the text. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. That is, he wishes there were no God. Many tamper with their own hearts to bring them to a persuasion that there is no God. And when they cannot do that, they conjure up wishes that there were none. Men naturally have some conscience of sin and some notices of justice, Romans 1 verse 32, 
They know the judgment of God, and they know the demerit of sin. They know the judgment of God, and that they which do such things are worthy of death. What is the consequent of this but fear of punishment? And what is the issue of that fear but a wishing the judge either unwilling or unable to vindicate the honor of his violated law? When God is the object of such a wish, it is a virtual undeifying of him. Not to be able to punish is to be impotent. Not to be willing to punish is to be unjust. Imperfections inconsistent with the deity. God cannot be supposed without an infinite power to act. And an infinite righteousness is a rule of acting. Fear of God is natural to all men, not a fear of offending him, but a fear of being punished by him. The wish in the extinction of God has this degree in men, according to the degree of their fears of his just vengeance. And though such a wish be not in its meridian, but in the damned in hell, yet it has its starts and motions and affrighted and awakened consciences on the earth. Under this rank of wishers, that there were no God, or that God were destroyed, fall, number one, terrified consciences, that see nothing but manner of fear round about, as they have lived without the bounds of the law, they are afraid to fall under the stroke of his justice. Fear wishes the destruction of that which it apprehends hurtful, it considers him as a God to whom vengeance belongs, as a judge of all the earth. The less hope such an one has of his pardon, the more joy he would have to hear that his judge would be stripped of his life. He would entertain with delight any reasons that might support him in the conceit that there were no God. In his present state, such a doctrine would be a security from an account. He would as much rejoice if there were no God to inflame in hell for him as any guilty malefactor would if there were no judge to order a gibbet for him. Shame may bridle men's words, but the heart will be casting about for some arguments this way to secure itself. Such as are at any time in Spira's case would be willing to cease to be creatures, that God might cease to be a judge. The full is said in his heart, there is no Elohim, no judge, fancying God without any exercise of his judicial authority. And there is not any wicked man under anguish of spirit, but were it within the reach of his power, would take away the life of God and rid himself of his fears by destroying his avenger. Number two. Debauched persons are not without such wishes sometimes. An obstinate servant wishes his master's death, from whom he expects correction for his debaucheries. His man stands in his corrupt nature. It is impossible but one time or other, most debauched persons at least have some kind of velleities or imperfect wishes. It is as natural to men to abhor those things which are unsuitable and troublesome as it is to please themselves in things agreeable to their minds and humors. And since man is so deeply in love with sin, as to count it the most estimable good, he cannot but wish the abolition of that law which checks it, and consequently the change of the lawgiver which enacted it. And in wishing a change in the holy nature of God, he wishes the destruction of God, who cannot be God if he sees to be immutably holy. They do as certainly wish that God had not a holy will to command them, as despairing souls wish that God had not a righteous will to punish them, and to wish conscience extinct for the molestations they receive from it, is to wish the power conscience represents out of the world also. Since the state of sinners is a state of distance from God, and the language of sinners to God is depart from us, they desire as little the continuance of his being as they desire the knowledge of his ways. The same reason which moves them to desire God's distance from them would move them to desire God's not being. Since the greatest distance would be most agreeable to them, the destruction of God must be so too. 
because there is no greater distance from us than in not being. Men would rather have God not to be than themselves under control. That sensuality might range at pleasure. He is like an effer sliding from the yoke. Hosea 4.16 The cursing of God in the heart, feared by Job of his children, intimates a wishing God despoiled of his authority, that their pleasure might not be damped by his law. Besides, is there any natural man that sins against actuated knowledge, but either thinks or wishes that God might not see him, that God might not know his actions? And is not this to wish the destruction of God, who could not be God unless he were immense and omniscient? Under this rank fall those who perform external duties only out of a principle of slavish fear. Many men perform those duties that the law enjoins with the same sentiments as slaves perform their drudgery and are constrained in their duties by no other consideration but those of the whip and the cudgel. Since therefore they do it with reluctancy and secretly murmur while they seem to obey, they would be willing that both the command were recalled and the master that commands them were in another world. The spirit of adoption makes men act towards God as a father. A spirit of bondage only eyes him as a judge. Those that look upon their superiors as tyrannical will not be much concerned in their welfare and would be more glad to have their nails pared than be under perpetual fear of them. Many men regard not the infinite goodness in the service of him, but consider him as cruel, tyrannical, injurious to their liberty. Adam's posterity are not free from the sentiments of their common father till they are regenerate. You know what conceit was the hammer in which the hellish Jael struck the nail into our first parents, which conveyed death, together with the same imagination to all their posterity. God knows that in the days you eat of it, your eyes shall be open and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Alas, poor souls! God knew what he did when he forbade you that fruit. He was jealous that you should be happy. It was cruelty in him to deprive you of a food so pleasant and delicious. The apprehension of the severity of God's commands rises up no less in desires that there were no God over us than Adam's apprehension of envy in God for the restraint of one tree moved him to attempt to be equal with God. Fear is as powerful to produce the one in his posterity as pride was to produce the other in the common root. A reading from The Existence and Attributes of God by Stephen Charnock Practical Atheism